Okay, so um, in the next hour, we'll discuss how global hyperspectral imaging can be used to study bio and nanomaterials. Um, as I mentioned, you can use the chat to, uh, to ask a question um, and we'll be happy to answer them either throughout the presentation or at the end. So a short, short introduction to Photon Etc. We are a small company. We're based in, in Montreal, in Canada. Uh, we provide optics and photonics instrument. So in addition to our global hyperspectral dark field imager, we also have uh, infrared cameras in gas and MCTs, uh, widely tunable filters. Um, we also have a preclinical imager. So we have a broad range of equipment in the field of optics and photonics. Um, and we started in, in 2002. Uh, and today we will concentrate mainly on our newest dark field hyperspectral imager. Um, a little bit about myself before we start. So my name is Laura Isabel. Uh, I work as an application scientist, as well as the sales and marketing director at Photon Etc. Uh, and together with David and other engineers at Photons, um, I develop um, markets and applications for our product in the field of advanced materials. Uh, my background is in condensed matter physics. So, um, most specifically in photovoltaics. And this is why I will be showing a little bit of applications in this field, even if we will mainly concentrate on dark field and uh, nanoparticles today. So David. So hi everyone. Yeah, my, my name is David. Uh, I'm working at Photon Etc. as a project manager and also an optical designer. Um, I'm actually in charge of developing new some of the new instruments uh, that we do at Photon Etc. And uh, like uh, instruments like the one we're presenting to you today. Uh, my background is in optics and nanotechnology. So I've worked a lot with uh, uh, nanoparticles, uh, doing dark field imaging of those na nanoparticles during my graduate studies. Back to you, Laura. Thank you, David. Um, so since we, when we did some practice, we had some little trouble with our bandwidth. We will just cut our camera uh, to make sure that you can hear us correctly during the whole presentation. Um, feel free, if, if you also have some problems hearing us or if there is any technical issue, let us know in the chat. Otherwise, we will just go on forever. Let's start. So today, um, we will start by having an overview of global hyperspectral um, imaging microscopy. Um, and then we'll discuss which materials can benefit from such an analysis. Um, we will go over Photon Etc's technology and we'll do a demonstration and quick analysis. Uh, then we will open the floor for discussion. So first of all, what is dark field microscopy? Dark field microscopy is an imaging technique that collects the scattered light from a sample and discards the unscattered signal. Um, for example, here we have a, a schematic with the uh, nanoparticles um, on, on a glass slide. So the nanoparticles, they do scatter a lot of light. Uh, so in dark field microscopy, when you collect the scattered signal, you see the nanoparticles as bright dots. And of course, the area in between the nanoparticles does not scatter. So in that case, it's, it appears dark. So hence the name dark field microscopy. Um, so let me just advance here. Um, so dark field versus bright field. What's the, the, the big difference? Uh, basically, we have here uh, small schematics of, a, of a, a dark field and bright field systems. In, uh, in order to achieve dark field imaging, a special condenser has to be used, and it's called a dark field condenser. So basically, you have your light source. It goes in the condenser, and the condenser has a, a central block block that uh, prevents the light from going straight to the sample. So only light coming at uh, the edge, uh, it will come at an angle on the sample. And if there is no scattering, the light just continues straight through and is blocked at the objective aperture. It's not detected by the objective. So only that part of the light that is actually scattered by the sample, some of it will go straight into the microscope objective and then will make its way uh, in the system to the detection camera. Um, in opposition, in bright field imaging, uh, if you look on the, on the right, uh, there is no blocking of the light in the, uh, in the condenser. So all of this light is actually, the condenser is designed so that all of this light goes to the sample and continues through 
uh, the objective aperture and enters the objective aperture reaching the camera. So in that case, in bright field, the contrast is due to uh, sample absorption or, or some of the scattering of the light by the sample. Um, so here next to each schematic, you have a view of uh, uh, example images of what the, that can be obtained with these, uh, these techniques. Uh, actually, these are the same sample. I think these were 100 nanometer gold nanoparticles. So these are the, 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 the same sample viewed in, in dark field and in bright field. So we can see some details in, in bright field, uh, be the, but these are probably uh, just dust or big, big aggregates of nanoparticle. If you look at this small part here, you see there's, there's not much things in the, the, uh, this region. Whereas if you look here, you see uh, small spots everywhere. These are single nanoparticles that we can see in bright field, but these are completely invisible in, in um, so we can see them in dark field, but these are completely invisible in bright field. So this is the power of the, the dark field imaging technique to be able to see much smaller uh, particles. So let's go back to LoRa for global imaging. Thank you, David. Um, so I had some uh, some internet connection problems. So if you cannot hear me correctly, just let me know. So what is uh, global hyperspectral imaging? It is a non-destructive optical technique that combines spectroscopy and imaging. So each image is acquired at a narrow band of wavelength. So spectrally and specially resolved dark field or luminescence, transmittance and reflectance data can be acquired. So when analyzing this combination of spatial and spectral information, it's possible to identify certain spectral signature and attribute them to a certain composition or the presence of defects, for example. Um, as shown in the image, the spatial information is provided in the XY plane, while the Z axis contain all the spectral information. So it, each pixel here will provide a spectrum, either dark field, as I mentioned, or it can be luminescence or something else. So this technique can provide information about the homogeneities, uh, size and shape of the particles, uh, also their localization and distribution. And those are key parameters to orient the synthesis of nanomaterials. So this is also very useful um, to analyze biomaterials. So with global um, imaging modality, the incoming light is spread over the entire field of view. Um, and the scattered signal coming from every point of this field of view is collected simultaneously one wavelength at a time. So with point by point system or with line, the system is shown here in the figure, the entire spectrum is collected either in, in one point like, like shown here or in one line with, with push boom system. And the sample or the illumination has moved to reconstruct uh, the image. Um, global illumination can provide a faster acquisition and better image quality because there is no image reconstruction, reconstruction that is needed. Um, also, if there are moving particles in the sample, global imaging will be able to record this movement and reconstruct the path. With a point by point or line scan imaging system, there is a strong chance that the moving particles will be missed. So that, that's one advantage of looking at the entire field of view simultaneously. So when dark field microscopy is combined with hyperspectral capabilities, nanomaterials can be identified and localized. So the scatter spectrum depends on the composition and shape of the specimen. Uh, so the spectral information allows the identification of the sample. So we can also classify them by a uh, different family of spectra. Uh, while the imaging allows the localization. So this is why we mentioned that uh, um, we can assess homogeneities and distribution of the sample. Um, this approach provides useful information to orient and strengthen the fabrication process of the studied material. We can also add a polarization ability to the setup that will provide additional information on the orientation of the uh, observed materials. So let's have a look at what kind of samples can benefit from this technique. 
So good candidates for dark field hyperspectral imaging are samples that have an intrinsic low contrast in bright field illumination that David explained uh, before. So this is usually because either of their small size or because their refractive index are quite close in value to that of their surroundings. Um, such materials include nanoparticles like gold, silver, couples, like most of you are, are working on according to the survey we took at the beginning of the, of the webinar, um, as well as uh, spherical nanoparticles and other nanoparticles, um, diatoms, life cells and tissue, pathogens, um, and small objects like, like carbon nanotubes, hair, fibers, microplastics as well. So the application of this technique is quite broad. Um, so dark field imaging will provide a high contrast for those types of specimen in a wide variety of environment. So it can be in, in solution, in tissue, in live cells. And, and the combination of dark field imaging with the spectral mapping will provide rapid insight on, as, as we mentioned before, the distribution of the material and its composition. So to briefly summarize, global hyperspectral dark field imaging provides composition and distribution maps. Those maps can help improve the synthesis process, um, th and this will support the progress in bio and nanomaterials research. So, um, Fatan et cetera's hyperspectral system that is designed for dark field is called LIMA. It can be configured with a, an upright or uh, an inverted microscope. It is comprised of a supercontinuum source from NKT Photonics, uh, as you see here, a laser line tunable filter from Photon, etc., a beam shaping module, and a scientific grade uh, research microscope with dark field condenser and objectives. The system is compatible with various sources from NKT Photonics. Uh, for example, the FIU 15 and the Super K Compact have already been integrated in some of our instruments. This hyperspectral imager is compatible with both dry and also oil condensers and dry and oil objectives. Uh, so we're not limited to a specific configuration. The system is plug and play, uh, turnkey and easy to use. Um, while other available systems on the market are usually designed for spectral filtering of emission. So that means um, filtering after uh, after the sample. Uh, this platform is actually designed for spectral filtering of excitation. So we're filtering the light before it reaches the, the sample. And this provides a fast acquisition and high image quality. Um, the spectral filtering is done inside the laser line tunable filter here, uh, which actually uh, we, we come in with white light and this filters and only out outputs uh, monochromatic light. So let's see a bit more how, how this works. So the filtering technology uh, was developed by Photon etc. and uses volume bright gratings. A volume bright grating is actually a, a, just a small piece of glass with a periodic change of refractive index inside. So what does it do? Uh, basically it acts as a transparent window for most uh, wavelengths. Um, but because of the refractive index variation, there's a narrow bandwidth of a few nanometers that is diffracted to a different direction. So let's say you come with a red, green, blue light uh, coming in. So the, the, in that case, the blue and the red light just goes through and the uh, green light is diffracted to a different direction. The optical systems uh, that, that we built around that only selects this diffracted beam to direct out of the, of the filter. So it results really in the monochromatic light output from the filter, and we can use this for monochromatic uh, illumination. Uh, the selected wavelength, of course, is not always just a green light. So we can change which wavelength goes out uh, by simply changing the incident angle of the incoming beam on the grating. So if we change the, 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 the angles a bit, then you can have blue light, green light, red light coming out. So basically building a hyperspectral image from that is simply to uh, select one wavelength after the other. So we go out with uh, the, the blue light, we uh, illuminate the sample, we uh, get an uh, acquisition with the camera, and then we simply change a bit the light, the, the, the wavelength, 
we do another acquisition and so on until we've built the whole hyperspectral cube. So the advantages of this volume bracket grading is uh, uh, the, the high efficiency, also the high tuning range. So uh, a, a single volume bracket grading, we can change the angle and tune the, uh, the output light over a hundred of nanometer wide. Um, and of course, there's a really narrow band. So each wavelength, so if we, if we select uh, a green light coming out, uh, the, the, the actual band of light coming out is really narrow. So for example, in um, invisible, we have a, a, a width of uh, about two nanometers. It goes to about five nanometers in shortwave infrared. And we also have a special um, volume bracket grading, which have a, a really narrow band uh, lower than one nanometer. So this all results in a really high spectral resolution from this system. Um, so basically, so we have the, the white super continuum that goes in the, in the laser line tunable filter, uh, which uh, gets us a monochromatic output. So this goes in the, the system um, with uh, our own optical illumination uh, that is optimized to efficiency co efficiently couple the filtered light in the dark field condenser of the microscope. Um, so the whole Lima, we can have a different uh, wavelength con configuration. So a single imaging platform can cover from 400 to uh, 1000 nanometers. Uh, we can also have a version that goes from 900 to 1620 nanometer for the short wave infrared. Or we can even couple both to have a, a platform that goes from 400 to 1620 nanometers, both with a, with a visible SCMOS camera and a uh, infrared in-gas camera. Uh, in all these systems, the spatial resolution is actually diffraction limited and reaches about uh, one micron for typical objectives. And basically, it's the, the limitation is really at the objective. It depends on the numerical aperture of the objective that is uh, being used. Um, but of course, particles smaller than one micron can be detected. Uh, but as in any dark field microscope, uh, single nanoparticles need to be uh, separated enough from one another to be able to tell them apart. So uh, it's about, they need to be uh, about one micron from each other. But uh, really small nanoparticles, uh, uh, a few tens of uh, nanometers in diameter, they, they can be detected. You will see the, the, the bright spot from the particle. So in addition to dark field imaging, this system can also be used with a bright field condenser to perform standard reflectance and transmittance hyperspectral imaging. It can even be used for photoluminescence excitation hyperspectral measurements. It is also possible to add polarization measurement to get input on the orientation of a given specimen. So you can put polarizers uh, uh, in the illumination paths and also polarizers in the detec detection paths to do all sorts of uh, polarization analysis on your specimens. Um, the system is able to easily observe 30 nanometer gold nanoparticles. Um, in five minutes, the system is ready to go. Actually, it's really easy and, and, and fast to, to, uh, to, to set it up. Uh, probably the, the sample preparation for dark field uh, nanoparticles probably takes more time than, it take, than the time it takes to set up the sample and start an acquisition. So in addition to the Lima, uh, Photon etc. also produces a hyperspectral microscope, which is called EMA. The main difference is the fact that uh, the filtering technology is performed in emission, uh, so that means after the sample, uh, as opposed to uh, in, in Lima, where it's performed in excitation, so that means before the sample. So the EMA system is also suitable for dark field hyperspectral imaging. And it can perform standard bright field transmittance and reflectance, as well also as photoluminescence, uh, in that case, using laser excitation, and also electroluminescence. So in that case, you use um, probes and a source meter to excite the electroluminescence from your sample. Um, however, the EMA is less adapted for polarization measurements. So in that case, the LIMA is, is better. Um, the spectral and spatial resolution of both EMA and LIMA are similar. Uh, the LIMA is a bit faster 
because of the uh, tunable laser source, um, it responds a, a, a bit faster. But the EMA actually provides a wider variety of uh, optical measurements that can be done. So we've talked about uh, photoluminescence and, and things like that. So both, both systems are quite complementary to, to, to each other. Um, and now back to Laura for the demonstration. Yes, thank you, David. Um, so we pre-recorded the, the demonstration, but the, the acquisition you will see is uh, is in is in real time. So we did we did not do any any tweaking of of the video for the demonstration. But since we were all working from home, it was easier to pre-record it. So before we start, let's have a quick look at the experimental conditions. Um, so before. Uh, so what you'll see on the video is really when we start the acquisition, but the first step, step uh, would be turning on the system. And as David mentioned, it's, it's quite rapid. So we just have to turn on, uh, turn on the camera here. We turn on the super continuum source. When the demo will start, the shutter of the super continuum will be on. So you will see basically nothing on, on the screen. Uh, we need to turn on the LLTF as well. So for this demonstration, we used an upright Olympus microscope. We used NKT Photonics Super K Compact Laser and our own laser line tunable filter uh, covering 400 up to 1,000 nanometers with a spectral resolution of less than 2.5 nanometers. Um, we imaged 100 nanometers gold nanoparticles with a 40x dry objective, um, and it gave us a field of view of 330 by 330 uh, micron. So let's have a look at this demonstration. So what you see on the screen right now is Photon Etcetera's proprietary software, PhiSpec. So on the left, you can see all the parameters of the experiment. Um, the camera parameters like the exposure time, the binning, and the possibility to average images. We need to choose the right objective magnification in order to get the, the right parameters for the focus. We have a motorized focus that corrects the chromaticity of the system. With a typical point-by-point -point system, you acquire the whole spectrum in one point, which makes it impossible to get a perfectly focused image at each wavelength. Since we do a spectral scan, like David mentioned with our gratings, uh, we can correct the focus for each wavelength. This is why we need to choose the right objective here. It's possible to use a microscope with white lamp to perform unfiltered dark field imaging. And we will be using the LLTF, so our bandpass filter, coupled with a super continuum laser for the hyperspectral acquisition. So the first step of the experiment is to focus the sample. So we will start the image acquisition here. Now it's started. Um, we open the shutter and we enable the super continuum sources and we select the intensity percentage. Here we chose 100%. Then we adjust the focus um, and we can zoom here uh, to make sure that we find the optimal focus. Once it's done, we can increase the exposure time to improve the signal to noise ratio. Here we go. Now let's have a look at the acquisition sequence, which is on the bottom right here. Um, we can define the camera parameters, the spectral range and post-processing step. In the hyperspectral acquisition step here, uh, we will name the data. We define the first and the last wavelength and the step between each image. So here in that case, each image is separated by five nanometers. Keep in mind that the spectral step can be customized by the user. If you wanna do a quick scan uh, with 10 nanometer steps, 20 nanometer steps, or even smaller steps like one or two, you can customize it. Um, so the, the parameters are well-defined and we've already started the sequence of acquisition here. So while the system is scanning through the wavelengths by mechanically tuning the Bragg gratings, we can see the different stage of acquisition. Also, an approximation of the time remaining is indicated in the sequence here. Um, we can see that the scattered signal is quite strong. This is why the acquisition time per image is rather small. So it's 0.5 seconds uh, per monochromatic images. So I hope you can appreciate the overall acquisition time of the experiment, which should be done in about four seconds. So now the post-processing steps are being done, including the dark removal and the correction for the spectral response of the system. 
So we can look at the different monochromatic image here by sliding the bar at the top of our data. Um, so a bright region means that photons are being scattered at the wavelength shown at the top. So we will leave the image at 570 nanometers where we see a strong dark field signal. Now we zoom on the sample and we will place some targets. So each target will show a complete scattering spectrum of one, of one pixel. Since we have a four megapixel sensor, we just acquire four million spectra in, in like 40 seconds. Um, so we can create multiple target. Basically you can create as many targets as you want up to four millions. Um, and we can, uh, we can move them around to see the change in intensity, but also the shifts um, in wavelength. We can also create a selection that will show here the average of the dark field spectrum on each point that is being selected. And this selection can also be moved around to look at the different regions uh, if you want to have a cleaner output. So this is really a, the mean of all the dark field spectrum. Um, and we can also do a, a, some kind of correction of the data. So we can do like a Gaussian filter if you want to, uh, to have cleaner data. So now that we're done with the almost live uh, uh, demonstration, um, David and myself will show you some results with our software. So we will do some quick, uh, quick analysis. Um, so David will start by, by showing more, uh, even more dark field data. And I will show you also some, some different results live in FISPEC. So if you have some, some questions, uh, don't hesitate. So let me just uh, prepare um, my screen. So there you go. So this is um, this is our, our software FISPEC. I've already opened the uh, Hypercube of a, a similar sample as the one that was shown in the video. It's not the exact same cube, but I, I, I do believe it was the same sample. So these are uh, 100 nanometer gold nanoparticles. Um, so as you see here, we have a lot of particles uh, and we have the, the whole spectrum. Um, and uh, I'd like to show you uh, some of the uh, more advanced processing we can do with this system. So if we go in statistic, we can do principal component analysis. So basically what the uh, principal component analysis or usually uh, people call it PCA, uh, what it does is that, is that it, it searches um, in all of the spectra of, of every pixel in the, in, it, in the image and tries to find some similarities between these pixels. And it will, um, I'll put a map uh, giving the, um, the score of each of, uh, of, of these, um, uh, spectra that are, are most abundant in the image. So let's uh, start right now. So I'm just setting up quickly and uh, the calculation is in progress here. You see it goes, um, it goes quite fast and we get this here. So basically what you see the different colors. So the background is pretty much the same everywhere. It's a, a, a mostly empty uh, uh, background. And you see uh, the all the nanoparticles, these are the, the same nanoparticle. I, I, can, I can zoom in a bit so that we see them better. Um, so these are all, sorry, these are all the same particles, uh, but they do appear in different colors here in the PCA analysis. So this is simply because all these nanoparticles that have different color, they do have different spectra. Um, so at first I selected here um, these particles, which are, are all correspond to the um, violet ones that we see here. So these should have all the uh, pretty much the same spectrum. So let's just create a graph of this. So this one, I'll add this one to the existing graph. Uh, this one here, and this one. So you see, PCA tells you that these should all have pretty much the same spectrum. And when we do trace the spectrum, you see it's almost exactly the same. They, they are all on top of each other. So really PCA can, can tell you which, um, what is similar um, in, in your image. 
And we f if we move a bit and we, we check different um, uh, different nanoparticles, so I'll move the, the, the red one here. I'll go on this red, the, the, the one that appears in red in, in the PCA. So as you see, the spectrum is a bit different. It's more intense and it's a bit uh, shifted. It's a bit red shifted relative to the other. Uh, if I take the, the green one here and I go on top of the uh, the yellow nanoparticle that you see here, you see now the spectrum is quite different. It's much, much broader. This is probably uh, actually a um, uh, aggregate of, of two or more nanoparticles. And if I take that, that one here at the top and I put it on top of the uh, white particle here, as you see, again, there is still uh, a different spectrum. Uh, you see now we, we can find two peaks. It's a bit broader. So PCA really gives you uh, information about what's similar and what's different in your sample. It can be really useful to, um, to uh, detect the, the particles that are the same. And if you have different families of, of nanoparticles, it's uh, easy to uh, tell them apart. And one other nice thing that, that we can do in the processing, it's uh, spectral angle mapping. So basically, uh, we can tell the, um, the system to check for uh, some specific spectra. So in that case, we have a spectra for a single nanoparticle, a, spectra, a spectrum for probably, again, single nanoparticle, but a bit bigger or a bit shifted, and some spectra for, uh, for aggregate. And uh, we can use uh, uh, the SAM to try to give a score for every pixel to tell if, if it scores well for this spectrum or that one or that one. So it's another way to tell the particles apart. So basically, what I'm telling him is to use the spectra here as basis for analysis. Um, and we can just run the calculation. And there you go. So it gives you um, here, this is the score for the red spectrum. So these are the nanoparticle that score high for the red spectrum. And then if we move the next one, oh, sorry, I'll go one at a time. So this is the score for the blue spectrum. And then if we go uh, for the, the green and, and light blue spectrum, you see the, the nanoparticles are not the same. So in that case, these are single nanoparticles here. And then if we shift to the other one, you see it's really more the aggregates that are highlighted. And again, for the last one, it's a bit different. So this is a really useful tool to um, try to go get more information and analyze a bit more your, your data uh, with, uh, with our software. I'm stopping this here and let's go back to Laura for more analysis. Yeah, give me one second. I will start sharing my screen. Okay, so now you should see my screen. Um, so what we've shown and discussed so far was pretty much all related to dark field imaging, which was the main subject of the webinar, so it makes sense. Uh, but with the LIMA system, uh, it's also possible to perform bright field uh, reflectance imaging by changing the condenser. And we can also do photoluminescence excitation that David previously mentioned, uh, which is called PLE. Um, PLE is a spectroscopy technique where the excitation wavelength is varied and the luminescence signal is monitored over um, either a fixed wavelength, but you can also monitor a fixed, a fixed, be, uh, a fixed band of wavelengths, sorry. Um, so PLE is really, it's an efficient technique to study absorption lines of a given materials, uh, interaction between energetic levels, and when combined with hyperspectral imaging, it provides a useful way to identify inhomogeneities and non-radiative losses. Um, so, um, so let's have a look at, at a few results here. So on the left of the window here, uh, you can see reflectance imaging. So this is all done in, in bright field. And on the right, this is PLE. And then at the bottom, it's PL imaging that was performed with IMA. Um, so those results were performed on perovskite 
uh, crystals. Thank you, uh, Nick Rolston um, from Stanford University for, for letting us share those, uh, those results. Uh, so perovskite is a uh, is a really popular candidate for 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 solar cells. As I mentioned, my big my background is in photovoltaics, so I could not results uh, resist showing you some some results on on PV application. So here you can see some reflectance imaging. While I move the wavelength, I move the wavelength that is being reflected. And here on the top, if I move the PLE wavelength on the top. What you see is the excitation wavelength that is being changed, but we're, we're always monitoring the same band around 700 nanometers. So we're looking at the specific band and we're changing the excitation here. With the PL, uh, we are exciting at 532 and then we're looking at the emission over different wavelengths. So this is our main peak here and then we don't have any, any more signal. Um, so let's have a look at a few, uh, a few data. So um, I have selected different targets here that are already selected, uh, and they are located at the exact same area, uh, exact same pixel, sorry. So for reflectance and PLE, the two blue targets are, ex are actually at the exact same uh, point, and the red and the, the pink-ish targets are also at the same point. So you can compare. Um, uh, compare those results, look at change in intensity, you can look at shifts as well, um, and we can also add here the photoluminescence. So all the results were normalized uh, in order to make them easier to, um, uh, to compare. So those are just normalized reflectance, PLE, uh, and photoluminescence results. So this is the kind of results you can get, but we can also do some, some quick maps. So let's have a look here at our PL. Um, so we can quickly obtain a map of the maximum intensity, showing the maximum intensity on each pixel. So let's do this. Here we go. So this is, this is our um, the map that we obtain. Of course, this is normalized data, uh, but the yellow a uh, yellower region will exhibit a stronger PL signal and the darker region will, will exhibit the lower PL signal. So you can obtain with this kind of map really rapidly uh, an idea of non-radiative losses in, uh, in your sample. So we can also map the central wavelength of the emission peak. Uh, this map will provide the wavelength at which the peak of intensity is obtained in nanometers. So let's do this quickly in processing statistics maximum position map. So we'll basically um, trace a, a Gaussian and look at where is the main peak of, of emission. Um, so you'll get different spectral signatures, spectral shift that you can, uh, that you can assign to different defect. So this is the map that we, uh, that we obtain. We can change the color. So here, if we look at the brighter region, this means that photons are being emitted towards 760 nanometers, while darker regions uh, are um, will show photons that are being emitted around 750 uh, or even lower wavelengths. So what we can do is put this map on top of our data to make sure that it really does reflect um, the results. So let's do an overlay. We will choose the right maps we just done. We can change also the opacity to see the, to still see the, the, the cubes behind the map we've just done. And then we can add those targets in a new graph, which is also normalized. So don't mind the, the units here, everything it should be normalized. So here, according to our map, if we go in a bright region, we should see a peak emission around 760, even at higher wavelengths and darker regions here, can let me drag and drop this, um, are blue shifted. Um, so we have an emission towards 748 and 50. So that's exactly what we've seen. And we can zoom in and try to find a, a spectrum in between those uh, those two regions. So we can really see this, uh, this shift uh, of wavelength. So the combination of those optical measurements 
can actually guide the fabrication methods. So we can help the fabrication methods in dark field, but we can also do that with uh, with luminescence uh, by, by the identification of the defects. We'll see the inhomogeneities, but also uh, potential losses. So we'll stop sharing our screen, but we can go back to our results uh, later if you have uh, if you have questions related to our software. So to conclude, uh, we presented a new technique based on a super continuum source and a laser line tunable filter um, that, that we're used to perform spectrally and specially resolved dark field imaging. Um, this technique is compatible with dry and oil configurations, uh, but there's also the possibility to add polarization measurements and to perform bright field and luminescence imaging which, within the same system. So this imager can help investigate the size and shape of particles, uh, but also we can identify composition, homogeneities. I think we repeat that quite a lot in the distribution. And we can also track moving specimen because of the fact that we're doing global, uh, global imaging. Um, so, of course, as we also mentioned multiple times, this will help us uh, and help researcher get a better understanding of um, the optical and physical properties of their bio and nanomaterials, the interaction between materials and help improve the synthesis pro uh, process. So with that, we will end our webinar and we will look at a couple of questions we receive during the webinar. Maybe we can reopen our cameras. Hi. Okay, so we received a lot of questions. Um, let's start the Q&A show question list. Doesn't, sorry, it doesn't show, I think. Okay. So we got a question from Andre that says, so we need the, so in your group, you need to obtain hyperspectral imaging of DNA comets that are being used while uh, comet assay. That does the presented system allow acquisition images of DNA comets without using fluorescent dyes? Okay, so thank you, Andre, for your question. Um, David, can I leave this one to you? Uh, yes, um, actually, um, I, I'm not very familiar with the uh, DNA comets assays, but from what I've read, it's uh, um, you have some some DNA packets and, and, and you try to to get information from that. So uh, the question is actually, uh, does the DNA um, the the way it's uh, it's uh, assembled in the uh, in the assay does it scatter light? If it does scatter light, uh, then dark field uh, could could be a, a technique that can be used for that. Uh, but it, it would need to be tested on a sample just to see what kind of information you can you can get out of that. If you do target your DNA uh, with nanoparticles, if you can attach nanoparticles to your DNA and and check uh, a bit how it, it 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 goes in the in the assay, uh, then in that case, definitely it's it's probably gonna gonna work because uh, nanoparticles are easy to see in dark field. So um, yeah, um, contact us uh, and and maybe we can continue the discussion and to see what what can be done. Thank you, David. So I will publish a rather long question and I will, David, if it's okay with you, I will let you read it. And while you you assess this question, I'll look at shorter question that I might be able to uh, answer quite uh, rapidly. Um, so we got a question from, uh, from Revia, I think from Taiwan, um, that ask us if we needed to calibrate the filter. So yes, there's there's a need for a, a spectral calibration before starting the, the overall acquisition, but it's not something that you need to do like every week. So once this, the filter is calibrated, uh, you're actually okay for a couple of months. And even more than that, if you don't ch change the configuration, if you don't move the, the LLTF around. Um, we also got uh, questions before we started the webinar, which was about the spectral range covered by the LIMA, a question that was actually covered by, by David. So um, as he mentioned, we can cover 400 up to 1,000 nanometers, which is basically CCD range or SCMOS, uh, but we can also cover the infrared 
infrared. Uh, so 900 up to 16, 20 nanometers or both. So we can put two cameras and extend the range of our LLTF. Um, oh, uh, another another question from, from Revia. And, and then I'll, I'll check with David if he got time to, to read this, the, the other question. Um, can we upgrade the current, uh, a current microscopy system? Um, so we basically need to know the Brennan model of your microscope, but this is, uh, it is definitely possible to integrate um, NKT photonic super continuum with the LLTF and our illumination module into an existing microscope and basically upgrade it into a, a LIMA and a hyperspectral microscope. So that's, that's a possibility, but we'll need to know exactly what is the existing setup because sometimes there is no available ports to add um, illumination. David, did, did you get the chance to read Alexander's question? Yes, uh, yes, it's a it's a, a big and, and quite technical question. So um, I, I can answer a bit, but maybe Alexander, we can you can contact us and, and we can go a bit more into details. But basically, you're you're asking about uh, the, the the background uh, removal we have to do on, on 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 these samples. So this is part of of the the processing. You have to do some some post-processing after doing an acquisition, you have to do some processing. It was all automatized in the, the video we, we've shown, but you have to uh, remove the, 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 the baseline of the camera, which is present in every camera. Uh, we can do a, a, a uh, automatic uh, sequence to, to, to perform that. Uh, so it's quite easy to do. And you have also to uh, normalize your acquisition with the, the response of the system. So that requires to do a, um, a, a measurement on the a, a, a standard uh, scattering sample. Um, so this is something that can uh, that that can be done and automatized. Of course, all the time when you do an acquisition, it's better to prevent as much as possible from having lights uh, on top of the instrument that 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 shine on your sample. So if it's possible to just turn off the lights, it will help to prevent having some some parasitic uh, light coming in in your sample. If it's not possible to turn off the light uh, uh, in the, the in the lab, then uh, as you suggest, uh, Alexander, maybe a, a big dark box uh, that you if you're able to put a big dark box on top of the system, it, it could help. But yeah, as much as possible, it's better to try to remove all of the external light as much as possible. If you do have some light, uh, the, the processing you're doing uh, can help uh, remove some of that, but in, in some really uh, sensitive uh, um, situation, it, it, it's better to try to <laughs> remove it uh, as much as possible. But um, contact me, please, uh, Alexander, and, and we can discuss that uh, a bit further in, in details. Thank you, David. Um, so let me publish another question also from Alexander. Uh, if there is any issue with water-based objective, um, so I don't know, David, if you're familiar with water-based objective, if you can help answer this, this question. I'm not. Personally, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't used the. Uh, I haven't really used the water-based objectives, um, but it, it works with air objectives. It works with oil immersion objectives. So basically, it's just a, a different um, uh, different medium. So it should not. Um, in my opinion, it should not cause any problem, uh, but I do not have a lot of experience working with that. You're talking about uh, spectral on hydrophobicity, um, which, uh, uh, so I think in that case, you're, you're talking about uh, using a, a, um, a standard for the standard uh, dark field uh, um, to, to measure the instrument response system. So in that case, uh, yeah, you might have to think a bit uh, for for how you do your your, your standard. Uh, maybe you need a different uh, different kind of sample or something. So um, from what I understand, you'd like to try the spectral on with water based objective. If if um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, what you want to do, but for uh, acquisition of, of your signal and your sample, uh, if it's water-based and you have a water-based objective, I don't I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work in that case. Thank you, David. Um, so another question here, um, if you work with diatoms that are tens of micro 
micrometers long. Uh, could PCA give you the spatial distribution of scattering peaks across the diatom structure? So maybe I can I can answer this one um, because I've done some measurements on, on diatoms. And basically, if you do have different family of spectra, the PCA will work no matter how how big is your is your structure, um, and if it's it's bigger than nanoparticles, then it's it's good because we can either use different objective um, for to look at an even even bigger uh, field of views, um, so you'll be able to assess uh, an even bigger area of of your sample quite rapidly, and you, we should be able to distinguish them quite uh, quite easily. Um, so I don't know, David, if you want to add something to that or if my answer was okay. No, your answer was, was perfect. Um, and I see Dan is a, has a follow-up. So even if the structure is continuous, so basically everywhere in your structure, every pixel has a spectrum. So if the spectra uh, along this are all similar, a PCA will catch that and, and will tell you it's the, all the, the, same, the, same, um, the same spectrum. And you have, if you have different spots with different spectrums inside your your uh, your diatom, uh, then it's it's great because PCA will see that and will tell you exactly uh, where are the different spectra. And we have a follow up question from Dan, so let me publish it right away. Um, so he thank us for the exciting presentation. So you're welcome. And basically ask us what is the main difference with other commercially available systems, which is a which is a really good question, because sometimes you develop a solution and you're like, what is the problems? Because there are other solutions that are already answering that. Um, so I would say that one of the advantage is really the fact that uh, our system is designed to work with both dry and oil objective and condenser. And the fact that it can combine other type of optical measurements polarization measurements, luminescence measurements. So it's, let's say the versatility, the polyvalence of the, of the system that will make it unique. The fact that we do global imaging, so looking at the whole field of view simultaneously, there is no image reconstruction. So the image quality will be good and it's a really fast system. So we did some comparison with, with, with our competitors and we got better image quality at a, at a faster pace. So of course, if, if the if you have plenty of times uh, on your hand, that might not be uh, some some selling point. But I would say that those are the main the main selling point of 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 the system and and the main difference. So the the versatility, the fact that you can upgrade an existing microscope. It was designed by by physicists, so it's 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 really done for um, modular system uh, that can be upgradable and and really designed for your specific needs. David, I don't know if you want to add something to that. Yeah, one, one more point, uh, one more advantage of uh, in, in the case of the, the Lima, uh, we're doing filtering before the sample. So all the light that goes on the sample is just the mon monochromatic light that you're interested. Um, so it, it might not be an issue for every sample, but some samples which are heat sensitive, you don't want to, to send too much light and, and have them heat and transform before your eyes so with the lima you're 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 restricting the amount of light that goes uh you're restricting with only the wavelengths that are of interest at that moment uh and and you shine on it with other systems you have a big um uh halogen lamp that shoots a lot of light on your sample and it can in some some cases it can start to heat it and and maybe cause problems so Again, it might not be an issue for every sample, but more sensitive samples, it, it, it uh, might be necessary to go to lower intensity. Whereas uh, with our Lima, we can still still keep 100% intensity and there, there's only the light really needed at that moment. So it's uh, much better. And if I can uh, if I can add something regarding to the image quality, I was referring to when we compare to point by point system or line scan system that requires an image reconstruction. So other system might provide this global illumination, um, and when you don't need to reconstruct an image, this is where you will get a better image quality. So that was the reference I was um, going for. So. We have a question about the spectral unmixing possibility with the software. Um, David, can you comment on, on this one? 
Um, yeah, quickly, um, spectral and mixing can, can be done with many various different techniques. So we've presented the um, principal component analysis and also uh, spectral angle, angle mapping, um, which are included in our software, uh, but you might find that other techniques are more suitable for, for your sa sa samples or something like that. So it, it can be done uh, so all the acquisition can be done with the, the software, of course, and then it, it could be output to other, other software programs for uh, if you have really specific needs for spectral unmixing. But if PCA and, and uh, spectral angle mapping works for you, then it can all be done with, with our own software. Thank you, David. Um, so we have five minutes left oh we have a, a good question actually let me publish that from from greg regarding the speckle from the laser so do we have any issues regarding that and we've actually integrated a, a beam shaping module in which uh we get rid of the speckle speckle of the laser so we do have some clients that want to provide their own illumination and they do have this kind of problems uh, but with with our beam shaping module we do have um uh, something specific to get rid of the of this of the speckle of the laser so it's a basically a mode shaker um, so this is this is mandatory whenever you do global imaging uh, because otherwise you'll have speckle and you'll have some inhomogeneities in your illumination and you won't be able to know if this inhomogeneities is due to your sample signal or from your illumination so we do have something specific for that thank you greg so we have three minutes left. Not sure if I answer all the questions. We did have a follow-up question uh, from uh, Raoul that asked us, it would be great to see a comparison of your system with, with other systems. Um, we'll be happy to, to do some, some measurements for you on, on your samples if you want. Uh, we didn't really want to compare different systems and, and do some some bad publicity for for other <laughs> other companies but if you want to send us some samples um i wrote down the the um uh the email address so at info at photonetc.com anyone who attended the, the 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 webinar who wants to try some samples and do their own comparison and really see the the advantage that we that we can provide we will be happy to uh, to collaborate so with that, I think we will end the webinar. Um, wonderful. Uh, thank you everybody for from being here from Germany to, to Taiwan. We had people from, from California. Um, so it was, it was wonderful. I, I really hope that you remain safe and, and healthy. I hope that we'll have the, the chance to collaborate in, in the future as well. So don't hesitate to reach out and uh, we'll be happy to further discuss. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a nice rest of the day or night for people who are farther away. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.